Hey, uh, Pastor Treister, come on up here. Pastor Treister and I have been friends a long time because we're old. And um, one of our most bonding experiences, oddly enough, happened in India. And I just want to take a second to tell you about it as I run off of the stage. My wife had never been hospitalized at any time other than pregnancy, uh, like for the actual delivery. And there was once that we were on the way to a hospital. Um, we walked into the emergency room. They put an IV in her arm and we just, I don't know, we, we felt a stirring of the spirit and we prayed and took the IV out and walked out. And uh, God blessed us. And whether it was divine healing or stupidity, I will never know. We just know that God healed us. And I was in a conference in India with Eric and we were preaching and um, I got a, 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 an idea. I thought that I should, I should drive a motorcycle through the mountains in India. I thought that that would be a good thing to do. And it seemed like a good idea until I was hit by a bus. I left a big dent in the bus. And um, beard shape and all. Yeah. And when we dusted that off and got back to uh, the place we were staying, I got a phone call that my wife uh, was on the other end and she was desperately sick, dehydrated. And she fainted while on the phone with me. And uh, you can imagine how that must have felt. Like I'm on the exact other side of the world and she passes out while on the phone and I, I don't know what is, is happening. Uh, during that moment, a demoniac uh, across the street starts throwing bottles and <laughs> all kind of neat things. Uh, um, neat things and um, it was I don't know close to midnight and uh, I walked upstairs to get my Bible and was walking out of the room quietly and Pastor Trister heard me he said what are you doing I said ah oh, brother I'm sorry I did not mean to disturb you I'm on my way out where are you going I'm just going to pray well you're not going to pray without me He prayed with me for 24 hours without stopping. Not a bathroom break, not a water break, not a complaint. He prayed for me, with me, like it was his wife that was in trouble. This is a brother that you want with you in a foxhole. Now, when you've been awake for more than 24 hours, like when you skip a night's sleep, you know that next night's special? You know that? When I went to sleep that night, I had a dream, which is not normal for me at all. And in the dream, uh, a church was beckoning uh, Eric to come forward. They were, they were calling for him. When we got back to the States, bodies of believers began reaching out to Eric saying, we would like uh, you to pastor us. And he has been through many ups and downs with that. Uh, and his character has shined through brightly. He is a brother that will not give up on anything that God has told him. Do we have some new life folks here today? Who in the house is for new life? <laughs> Listen. Be prepared to be blessed. If you have a pen or pencil, you're going to want to write what is about to come. And uh, uh, this is our second to last session. So you're going to want to get all of this. Amen. Do you want to get it all? Yeah. Do you want to get it all? Yeah. Amen. I know you want to get it all because this worship that we just had was one of the best. It's like it just keeps getting better. I mean, y'all brought it. I was amazed because it's really difficult to go out there and get your stomach all full and then come up here. And you go, uh, I didn't get that this time because the worship was so amazing. Um, can we give the Lord a hand for that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this worship, Lord. It was so amazing. It's so good. And uh, yes, I remember that night, Pastor. Eric. Um, I'm one of those guys that when the devil messes with one of my family members, I get really upset. I really do. And I particularly remember uh, part of that night praying for my sister, being in a fetal position because I was so mad. That's what I ended up in and just crying out to the Lord and travailing. And uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm not the only one here. 
I know there's other people in here that do the same things. And uh, that's, a, that's a special gift that God gives us to be able to tr- travail in prayer for somebody. And we've got to have those kind of people around us or else we won't make it. So um, just a while ago, Buddy was sharing with me about Kim being sick. And I got mad right back there on the back of the aisle. And I, was, I'm, I get so mad at that sometimes I cry. I don't like the devil messing with my family members. Amen. I don't like it. So uh, you want to see me mad? Mess with my family members. <laughs> There's about 400 of y'all in here. So y'all can get really mad. You start messing with you guys. Hey, I'm honored to be here. I really am. Uh, it's a privilege beyond anything that I can explain to you guys. Um, it's a, an amazing blessing and honor to stand before such men and women of God. And be able to share his words with you guys. When, when I know that a lot of you guys know this word better than me. So it's quite a privilege and a responsibility. And I don't take it lightly. Um, it's always amazing that when you get to go towards the last, you, you, you want to sometimes think, well, how are you going to follow that? You just got to say, shut up, devil. Amen. Shut up. Because you know what? I'm going to go the same way the men of God went before me. They were led by the Spirit of God. So I'm going to be led by the Spirit of God. That's how you follow all of this. As you continue to be walking in the Spirit like they were. Our God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Because that's what the enemy's trying to do. Oh, you can't follow that. Watch me. Watch. See what I do. Yeah. So, we are New Life Ministries from Victoria, Texas. I'm standing on the stage wearing a life-changing ministries and fellowship. That tells you how old that shirt is. Yeah. And the reason I'm wearing that is because I am, I am the fruit of some amazing men of God's loyalty to their king. The same king that I serve. I am the fruit. See, they... they uh, They took that word seriously when Jesus said, you must bear fruit for the kingdom. So I am fruit from life-changing ministries. So I'm wearing this shirt to honor the men of God that have allowed me to be where I'm at and do what I do. Because without them and without all of you guys, we, we, we can't do this. We have to have everybody. We're all in this together. So, uh... Just so I can recognize the, the people that came with me, somebody asked me, how many people did you bring? I said, well, I bought, our church bought eight plane tickets, but we brought nine people. Isn't that right, Eddie? Yeah. Stand up, Eddie. Felicia. Go ahead, Sammy. You can stand on the chair so we can see you. I think this was Sammy's first trip on an airplane and the enemy was trying to make him not like it because we got somehow we got lost getting to the airport in Houston and we were so late um, some brothers from Sugarland had to hold the gate for us because we were so late and we're trying to run to the gate and he's throwing up all over the place and it's like hey we got to go to the bathroom I said no we don't we got to get on the plane we're about to miss it so the enemy was really trying to keep these guys from coming they came last year so they're here again Eddie Felicia and Sammy Nelson and what's What's the new one gonna? Luke, what did he say, Luke? Luke Isaiah. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then behind those guys, we have a young man named Clay Stitt and his wife Sarah, newlyweds. I had the privilege of uh, marrying this young couple just a month ago. So they're newlyweds. I think this is their first trip together. Coming to a one association meeting. Clay got born again in my living room. Got baptized in the Coca Canyon River in Peru. Uh, 22 years old. Is that right, Clay? 22? Amen. Loves the Lord. Wants to serve Him. Amen. Then we have Miss Janice back there. She's trying to be all quiet and hide. Janice, yes. The one, the one lady among our church that has so much wisdom, we don't know what to do. She's just so full of the word, just quietly though, and just, 
She's an uh, inspiration to, to all of us. So thank you. Um, my wife's back there, but you still have a grandson sleeping on your lap? Oh, well, then you can stand up. A while ago, she had one of my grandsons sleeping on her lap. That's my wife, Valerie. My sweetheart. And next year, I'm going to have the privilege of celebrating 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Take that, devil. Ha, ha. Ha. Take that, devil. And, uh, you know, I'm so blessed as a man of God that I'm going to recognize one more person. Go ahead and stand up, Justin. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. Somebody was asking me a while ago, hey, what's the connection? They didn't know what the connection was. I said, that's my son. Yeah. Yeah, that's him. I'm so proud of that guy because uh, I can tell you 100% certainly that he can preach better than me. I know that to be true. Because I've listened to some of his messages. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I am so blessed. Yeah, I'm so blessed. Hallelujah. So, uh, y'all came ready for worship a while ago. Are you ready for some word now? Yeah. All right. So the title of our message from New Life to you guys today is From Desolation to Restoration. And we're going to take a little journey through the word today. From Desolation to to restoration. So if you have your swords with you, open them up to the book of Leviticus. And when you find Leviticus, say, Arise! Arise. It's our way of honoring the Arising Church. For um, we, we just want you guys to know that New Life blesses, blesses you guys. We love you so much. So we're going to honor you every time we turn. We're going to say, Arise! Because that's our way of honoring you guys. We love you guys. Um, this is this is really amazing um, and challenging. So we like it. Hallelujah! Did everybody find Leviticus? Yeah. It's not that hard to find, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I'm going to give you the easy one first. So when we started putting our message together a couple weeks ago, I sent everybody home with homework. I said, "Y'all go home, pray that God will give you a scripture on restoration." Restoring desolate inheritances, bring it back. We're going to put them all on a big board and we're going to, we're going to see what God wants to say. So they did that. They brought them all back. I think uh, a week ago we had like 20, 25 scriptures on a board and we wrote them all down. We looked at them. And then, of course, I get the duty of praying and studying and, and seeing what the Lord wants to say through all of this. Because if it's not the Lord speaking it, then it's not going to be good. And, you know, I learned something right off the bat when I was called into ministry. I learned real quickly that in and of myself, I don't have nothing to offer you guys. But the spirit of God that's in me, that brings the word of God through me, has something to offer to you. So if you get something out of this, this session, you didn't get it from me. And you didn't get it from New Life Ministries. It came from the Lord. Amen. It's a word from the Lord. Leviticus chapter 26. So as we were, as we prayed over all these scriptures and studied, you know, because the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. The Lord began to speak to me and give me all kinds of different scriptures that we didn't have on the board. And one of the first things that the Holy Spirit started speaking to me about was when we talk about desolation. And, you know, we're, we're really... Speaking about the desolation of Israel, when we think of restoring desolate inheritances. And so the Holy Spirit began speaking to me and saying, you know, you need to really check in there and find out how did they get desolate. So the first part of our journey today is going to be looking at how you get to that point of desolation. Now, I know we're talking about the nation of Israel, but you will see through these scriptures that they speak on a personal basis. They, spurk, they speak on a corporate basis. They speak on a national basis. So pay attention. It's not just about Israel. It's about you. Leviticus 26, starting in verse 13. Yeah. We love you guys. That's, a, that's, that's cool. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so that you should not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk upright. 
But if you do not obey me, and you do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my words or my statutes, and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commandments and so break my covenant, I, in turn, will do this to you. I will appoint over you a sudden terror, consumption and fever that shall waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you shall sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies shall eat it up. And I will set my face against you, so that you shall be struck down before your enemies. And those who hate you shall rule over you, and you will flee when no one is pursuing you. If also after all of these things you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Let me stop there for a second. Because if you haven't figured this out already, we're talking about rebellion. We are talking about rebellion. Now, I don't know if you can see up here very well. My hair might be a little bit too long for this, but right here in the middle of my head, there's a big V. A very large scar that I got in my head. If you can't see it, you can definitely feel it. My hair is a little bit long to see it right now. 32 stitches is what it took to close that. This here was not an accident. It was a result of rebellion. Plain and simple. We're going to call it what it is. See, that's the problem today is we don't call things what they are. We want to give it, oh, it's just an accident. No, this was a direct cause of rebellion. I was told something specifically. Do not do that. I did it anyways. And it almost killed me. Rebellion is dangerous. And the price of rejecting God is great. It's great. Rebellion is dangerous, folks. I'm just going to tell you straight up. It almost killed me. I was uh, six years old, but I can still remember it to this day because I had to walk back up a hill knowing I was going to be in trouble even though there was blood pouring down all over me. I, I disobeyed. Disobedience. Rebellion. Rebellion is bad. Let's continue to read on here because the more we read through this, the worse it gets. It doesn't get much better. It, gets, it just gradually, gradually gets to uh, a worse order of things. Verse 19, I will also break down your pride of power. I will also make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent uselessly. For your land shall not yield its produce. And the trees of the land shall not yield their fruit. If then you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. Really, how long does this have to go on before we learn how bad rebellion is? Huh. It's like, wow, at six years old, apparently I didn't learn my lesson either because I continued to, to do things in my life that I was told not to do. And I paid for it. When you rebel, there's a price to pay. There always is. 22. And I will let loose among you the beasts of the field, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that your roads lie deserted. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. And I, even I, will strike you seven times for your sin. We know that the number seven rep represents completion. God completely wants to destroy your sin. I hope and pray that you don't have to go seven times to get that figured out, though. Yeah, you get it figured out the first time and then get rid of it. Amen. Verse 25, I will also bring up on you a sword, which will execute vengeance for the covenant. And when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into the enemy's hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women 
will bake your bread in an oven and they will bring back your bread in rationed amounts so that you will eat and not be satisfied. Yet in spite of all of this, you do not obey me, but act with hostility against me. Then I will act with wrathful hostility against you. And I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sins. There it is again. You do one thing wrong, he might punish you seven times for it. Do you like punishment? I don't like punishment. But sometimes we don't learn the first time. I don't, I don't like punishment. It's better to obey. Verse 29. Further, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. Wow, now we're really getting crazy. Of the... What the rebellions caused. I will then destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and heap your remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul shall abhor you. I will lay waste your cities as well and will make your sanctuaries desolate and I will not smell your soothing aromas and I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you. As your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. This is a word from the Lord. He's telling them, look, you guys want to rebel? Go ahead. See, that's the one thing about God. He'll let you rebel. He'll let you do it all you want. But somewhere, sometime, there will be punishment. Plain and simple, the word spelled it out. Turn with me to uh, Deuteronomy. Say, arise when you find Deuteronomy chapter 29. Hallelujah. Let the word arise in your heart. Deuteronomy chapter 29, starting in verse number 16. For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the midst of the nations through which you passed. Moreover, you have seen their abominations, and their idols of wood, and stone, silver, and gold, which they had with them. Lest there should be among you a man... A woman, a family, a tribe, whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations, lest there shall be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. Did you see how small that rebellion started? It started with a man, and then a woman, and then a family, and then a tribe, and then a nation. See how small rebellion starts? Crazy, isn't it? I got a friend of mine that I was in the army with in the 1980s. I'd say that's a long time ago. That's a long time ago, isn't it? I kept in a little bit of contact with him. Uh, we were heathens back then, me and him both. He, uh, he got saved before I did. And then I got saved and I've kept in a little bit of touch with him. He lives in uh, East Texas. He goes to one of those... Uh, if you want to call it denominational churches. I don't like that word because I believe that denomination brings damnation. That's just what I believe. I'm sorry if you don't believe the way I believe. I believe that denomination brings damnation. So he goes to one of these churches, right? And do you know that their little church split because they couldn't figure out what color shingles to put on the roof? The roof was damaged. They needed new shingles. They couldn't figure out what color they wanted. Shingles. They split. So, in my mind then, that tells me that we started a new church that was already in rebellion. Correct? They started a new church that was already in rebellion. Because they rebelled against the other half. They didn't like it, so that's rebellion. What do you call something like that anyway? The third church, the rebellion? Uh, you know, I, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Do you know 
How many churches in this country today have been started by rebellion? That's, that's absurd. That's, to me, that's not even a church. I'm sorry. That, that's not a church. Matter of fact, I remember decades ago, some of you, some of you guys might remember this, but there was this uh, thing in California, I think it was called the Crystal Cathedral, something like that. That was years ago. Um, I think even it's been even 10 years ago now, maybe. I don't know. It's been a long time ago, but I read where the Crystal Cathedral, I was reading the newspaper. The Crystal Cathedral went bankrupt. They filed for bankrupt. And I'm thinking to myself, wasn't that supposed to be a church? And they filed for bankruptcy? I think they were morally bankrupt before they ever started. That they got to file for bankruptcy. Since when did the house of the living God be become about making money? That people got to file bankrupt because they didn't make enough. That's pretty sad. 19. And it shall be when he hears the words of this curse... And he will both say, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to destroy the watered land with the dry. Amazing thing right here. You see, among God's chosen people would be those that would choose to go their own way. It happens all the time. Among God's chosen people, people choose to go their own sinful way. Yet... They claim to be safe. They claim to be safe. You know, you've probably heard the same thing that I've heard. You, you, you're, uh, you're at HEB and you're, you're talking to somebody and you ask them, Hey, how's your relationship with King Jesus? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. You know why I know that? Because the Bible plainly clears, clearly says, and uh, y'all excuse my southern redneck colloquial, the Bible plainly says that humanity sucks at running their own life. Did he just say sucks in church? Yeah. yeah, I did. Because that's what the Bible teaches. We suck at running our own life. But God will let you try to run it as long as you want to. How far will that get you? How far has it got you? You can try all you want to and God will let you. Because if he did otherwise... He wouldn't be God. He'd be a robot. The Bible warns us, though, that those who profess to have peace and salvation and eternal life, but yet make no effort to follow God's will, judgment will come on them. That sounds like a harsh word, Pastor. It is. It is harsh. And I hope you take it that way. Because judgment will come. Are you judging me? Well, let me think about that for a minute. Let's see. I got the word of God inside of me. And I'm speaking the word to you. So if you're taking that as judgment, yeah. I'm judging you. Because that's what the word of God does. And if you don't like it, then you need to get right with him and stop arguing with me. Let's turn to chapter 30. Chapter 30. Verse 15. This one's really simple. Matter of fact, right before 15, there's a little heading in my Bible that says choose life. That's pretty simple. Why would you want to choose anything other than life? Yeah. Wow. Choose life. It says, see, I have set before you today life, prosperity, death, and adversity. And by the way, I'm not a prosperity pimp, so I'm just reading that. We're not taking up an offering. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. Notice he says to keep his commandments. Man, I, where's Rick Law on that? Is he here? Rick. 
Wonderful man of God. Amen. I'll never forget, Rick was showing some videos to a youth group. And these youth were going in this mall with a video camera. And they were just randomly asking people questions. And so one of the, one of the videos showed them asking this man about, Hey, if you think you could do away with one of the Ten Commandments, which one would you do away with? The guy thought about it for a minute and he said, well, you know, if a homeless man walked into a grocery store and he stole something because he's hungry, I think that'd be all right. So I think we could do away with thou shalt not steal. And the guy said, what part of thou shalt not do you not understand? Wow. We think today that we call these the ten suggestions. No, they are commandments. And if you don't follow them, then you're in what's called rebellion. And rebellion leads to judgment. Hello? Why are we in such a mess today? It's not rocket science. It's pretty easy. Obey these commandments. 17. But if your heart turns away, and you will not obey, but you're drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. And we read something like this and we say, well, I don't have a little idol that I pray to or none of that. Yeah, but if you've got something that's standing in the way of your relationship between you and God, then it's an idol. I'm sorry. It's an idol. You need to get rid of that stuff. God is a jealous God. He wants all of your affection. He wants all of your love. He doesn't want to compete with nobody or nothing. He wants all of you. Amen. Why, why would you hesitate to give all of you to Him? Hey, don't shout me down if I'm right. I'm just, don't hate me. I'm just the messenger. But I am giving you the word. Turn with me to Joshua. When you find Joshua 24, say, Arise. Arise. Joshua 24, let's start in verse 14. Let's see. Yeah. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So with Joshua and the Israelites, they understood that serving the Lord was not a one-time choice. See, there you go. There's your old te Older Testament argument about once saved, always saved. It's not true. And Joshua was explaining this to the Israelites. It's not a one-time choice. Those who follow God must continually make the choice to pursue His plans and do what is right. That requires a deep reverence for God, a firm commitment to His truth, a sincere desire to fulfill His goals for your life, and a strong determination to resist the appeal of sin. You've got to have that. Failing to choose to love and serve God will eventually result in judgment and desolation. That's true. Yeah. Judgment and desolation will be the final result. It's your choice. Let's keep reading there a little bit. Verse 16. I love what Joshua does with this. This is amazing. And the people answered and said, far be for, uh, for us to, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Interesting that they said that because right after Joshua died, what they do? They went right back to serving the other gods. It's like Joshua knew that ahead, didn't he? Right after he died. It wasn't long after that. For the Lord our God is he who brought us up, our fathers out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, and who did these great signs in our sight. And per... And preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. 
And the Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. <laughs> then Joshua said to the people, You will not be able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after you have done good. Speaks of rebellion again. Speaks of rebellion. Let's take it a little bit further. Let's go to Psalm. Psalm 81. When you find Psalm 81, say arise. Don't you just love these guys? Man. We love the Arising Church. You know, I've always told my people that, man, just once, I'd like to pack up my whole church and take them somewhere. Now I know where I want to take them because I didn't get all my church here, but I got most of them. So, uh, man, it's like, and then especially, you know, like when you go to a foreign country and you're, you're, uh, you're on the battlefield, you want to pack up everybody you can to get them over there. You know, it's so, it's so amazing uh, to step onto those places and see what God is doing. It's hard to go back to your church and explain those things. They just need to be there and experience it. So I'm glad that these guys came with me. Psalm 81, verse 11. Psalm 81, verse 11. But my people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart. To walk in their own ways. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. See, that's what God wants, not just for Israel, but that's what he wants for you. He wants for you to walk in his ways. You know, what we have and what we've just been through, we could consider that to be the written down word of God. It's written down for a purpose it's so that we would look into it and learn something from it. However, this didn't work. It didn't work for the nation of Israel. So God had to raise up some prophets. Men that would actually go to them face to face and bring more warnings. And speak the word of the Lord. That's what prophets do sometimes. They warn, they warn us. I wish we would have more of those warning voices for our country today. Some of these men that claim to be prophetic around our country, I think they're pathetic <laughs> because of what they say. They're not speaking the word of the Lord. So let's look at some of these uh, prophetic words that were spoken. Turn to Isaiah. Chapter 1. Say arise when you find chapter 1. How many of you know that the name Isaiah means the Lord saves? <laughs> the Lord saves. He was trying to send them warnings of a Savior. Words about a Savior. But we're going to look at the, the warning first. Isaiah 1 and verse 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amaz, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. So all you Bible scholars probably understand that at this particular time, we had the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah, right? Yep. So that's what was kind of taking place. Um, both of these kingdoms, the northern and the southern one, Israel and Judah, they had defied God and broke his laws because they decided that it was easier for them to rely on foreign nations and false gods for their security. That's what, this was, that's what was going on. So this prophet's coming to him. Listen to what he says. Verse 2. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. <laughs> you know, we want to talk about rebellion. All I got to do is get some parents to stand up and I guarantee you we'll learn real quick 
about rebellion, won't we? We understand that, don't we? Those of us that are parents. Yeah. It's really clear when, when we say things to our children and they don't listen. It's clear. We are all God's children. It's very clear to Him when He gives you something that you're supposed to do and you don't do it. And He gives you some rules that you're supposed to obey and you don't do it. It's very clear to Him that that's rebellion. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation. People weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corrupt, corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from Him. Why should you be beaten again as you continue, continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's nothing sound in it. Only bruises, welts, and raw wounds. Not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. Verse 7, it says, your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers, are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. He gave them his word in Leviticus, the law. Warned them that, hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Now, now he's having to send people and tell them, I told you so. Yeah, I told you so. They, they, they're finding themselves in a really bad place, aren't they? One more prophet. Turn to Ezekiel. When you find chapter 2, say, Arise. Ezekiel chapter 2. <laughs> what a beautiful place. Ezekiel chapter 2. Verse 1. Then he said to me, Son of man, Stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the spirit entered me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. And I'm sending you to them who are stubborn, and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God. As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Pretty obviously they weren't interested in listening. You know, sometimes the Lord will give you a word for somebody, and it'll be a word of warning. Don't be afraid to speak it. Because if they're in rebellion, they're probably not going to listen to it anyways. But your job is to be obedient to what the Lord is telling you to say. And say it. Give the warning. Amen. Don't hold back. Bring it. Maybe, just maybe, God will work something out through that warning. Don't ever be afraid. Amen. Speak the word. Good. And you, son of man, neither fear them. See, that's what I was telling you. Neither fear them nor fear their words. Though thistles and thorns are with you and you sit on scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. Wow. That's quite a few passages in the Older Testament. You think that rebellion stops there? No. <laughs> it sure doesn't, does it? It sure does not. So turn with me to the book of 2 Thessalonians. When you find 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, you know the drill. Right. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we're going to speed this up a little bit. We're just going to read verse 6 through 8 in 2 Thessalonians. Are you all still with me? I know we're talking about something tough here. Nobody likes to be talking about rebellion. It's not a it's not a pretty subject, but that's okay. I'll address the ugly ones. It doesn't bother me a bit. It's in the word. We need to know it. We need to learn from it. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse number six. For after all, it is only just for God to repay you with e- with affliction those who afflict you. And give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out punishment to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Rebellion. What does it say? That they will be punished. We don't like to hear that part. But it's true. Obviously, the nation of Israel struggled to grasp a hold of the fact that they shouldn't rebel against God. I think we struggle with it as well. That's right. Plain and simple. Our country's in the shape it's in today based on the fact that they've rebelled against the Word of God. Plain and simple. Uh, one more. Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 7. Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice... Do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. And in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Twice in... About five verses right there, it talks about a hard heart. See, that's what rebellion will get you to. That's what rebellion will cause. It'll cause a hard heart. When you do not listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin and rebellion, it starts a pathway that you get on like, Pastor Massey was speaking about the other night, going down that stairway. If you don't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you about this, then you will grow towards a calloused heart or a hardened heart. It may not get you there quickly, but it will get there to where you got calloused around your heart. That condition makes you no longer sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit or to the washing of God's Word. When you have a calloused or a hardened heart, it's difficult for even the Word to soften your heart. Don't do it. Listen. Sin, this is the last time I'm going to talk about this. Sin is the one thing that the more you practice it, the less you know you're doing. And sin will take you farther than you never wanted to go and cause you to pay more than you ever wanted to pay. You got to get rid of it. Hey, look, this, somebody say, rebellion is ugly. Rebellion is ugly. If y'all had enough of the ugly, I don't want to talk about the ugly no more. How about we talk about restoration? Because see, we want to go, we want to go from desolation to restoration. Man, I like that analogy of the desolation. The desert. It's dry. You know, there's not a lot of things that grow in the desert. 
And if they do, they usually got thorns all over them. And those thorns are like on this plant to say, hey, don't touch me. Don't rub up against me. I like the way I am. You know, people get thorns in their heart because they got hard, and they're basically telling you the same thing. Don't, don't share that word with me. Don't, don't rub off on me with that stuff. I like my condition. Don't let there be no thorns in your heart either. All right. Let's talk about restoration. 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 Here's a, just a definition or a few definitions that I picked. It denotes giving or receiving something back that was taken or lost. Making something new or close to its original condition. You know, I look out across this crowd of people today and I see men and maybe a few ladies, I don't know, that can walk into an old house and just in their mind they start seeing things. And then they start working on this old house. And they restore it. And it's, man, it's an amazing work of art. Or how about this one? Here's a good picture for you. When I was in high school, I had a friend. He bought a 1967 Mustang that was sitting out in a pasture. Wasn't even any tires on it. It was just, it was sitting there. The guy was done with it. Rust, there's a rust bucket. In South Texas, the rust will eat it all up. So this guy buys this 1967 Mustang for $500. 1980, yeah, that's, that's about what you could get for a beat up old rusted Mustang. And this guy took this Mustang and he restored it. I mean, the carpet, the motor, the inside, the seats. And he painted it candy apple red. And it was beautiful. I mean, to tell you that car, was beautiful if he still had that car today I don't know what it'd be worth but it was beautiful but I know something that's more beautiful than that when God restores a life Amen. when God restores a marriage Amen. when God does a restorating work in a person's heart and they surrender to the king of kings there's nothing more beautiful than that as beautiful as that Mustang was God's restoring work on the inside of somebody is the most beautiful thing that you can ever see or experience. It is beautiful. You know, the Bible speaks of restoration in many places. Many places. As a matter of fact, the largest number of scriptures that are put together in the, in the Older Testament, they're in the prophets and they do refer to the restoration of Israel. They do. Amen. That's what they refer to. Yes. However, when we start to look through these passages that we're going to look through, you will see some uh, personal references, some corporate references, and national references. So let's, let's do that. Can we do that? Y'all ready to do that? Yes. We won't talk about the ugly stuff no more. No more ugly. So let's turn to Second Chronicles. When you find chapter 7... That's where we will begin. Second Chronicles chapter 7. I think everybody in here probably knows this passage of Scripture, don't they? Right? Everybody, wants to, everybody quotes this passage of Scripture. But let's look at it a little more deeper and see what it says. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Let's read verse 13. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locust to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people, who are you today? Are you God's people? Yes. You see what it says here? If my people, we are God's people. Listen to what he says. Who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. See, this is this is how when you find yourself in a dry or desolate place. When you find yourself 
not having a desire for God's word. This is how you reverse that. He gives us four things that he requires us to do. And he in turn will do three, three things on your behalf. The four things that he requires us to do. Humble. Pray. Seek. Turn. See, the only way you get out of rebellion or sin is to turn. It's a complete turn. It's a 180. Amen. I walk that way. I'm walking that way in life. It's sinful. I hit the wall over there. Wow. I'm going to have to turn around and go the other way. You have to turn. So when you do those four things, this is what God will do on his behalf. He will hear. Amen. He will forgive. Amen. He will heal. Yes. The Bible makes it clear. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Yeah? Yes. The part there, though, is confess. You must confess. You must own it. You must call it what it is. Rebellion? Call it rebellion. Call it what it is. Don't hide it. Own it. It's the only way you're going to turn from it and get rid of it. Psalm 51. You know, it's amazing when you get to go last. You, you got to wonder, all right, how many of these guys are going to step on my scriptures? <laughs> and you know, for the most part, I was pretty safe till Pastor Zeke gets up here. And he starts, oh, let's go to Psalm 51. I was like, uh oh. Then he says, oh, let's go to Galatians. Uh oh. Hey, but you know what? If you, get, if you hear something twice, I mean, he's in Virginia and I'm in Texas, so I didn't go to his house and say, hey, what do you got? What are you studying? No, the same spirit of God that would lead me was leading him. So if we got the same scriptures, that means God's trying to tell you something today, right? All right. Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know, really, it's kind of interesting they put the word create there because the creating work was already done, so it would be recreate, wouldn't it? You ever thought about that? Something to think about. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. <laughs> Can we say that King David was desolate? He was in a dry place. Have you ever been in a dry place in your life? Yes. I've been there. I'm not ashamed to tell you. I've been, I've been in a dry place. I've been desolate. But I know how to get out of it. And I like the way King David is crying out to the Lord here. Because it really, if we study this out, in essence, he's not just telling God, Oh God, give me a clean heart. I, I messed up. No, he was so, uh, he was so mourning over what he did, his spiritual condition, he was telling God this. He's like, God, my heart is gone. I feel like it's not even there. Would you make me a new one? That's right. Even if there's nothing in there, make me a new one. You see, sometimes we need to have a new heart. Yeah. Sometimes we, we, we ruin this one. Yeah. We, we, we just totally ruin it. Uh, See, our heart has to be soft. Our heart has to be about loving people. And you see, that's one of the biggest, biggest problems that we have in America today. I like to explain it this way. Things were made to be loved. I'm sorry. People were made to be loved. Did you catch that? Mistake, wasn't it? People were made to be loved and things were made to be used. But see, in our country, we've reversed that. And we love things and we use people. And the reason that it happens that way is because our hearts are hard. And we're not being led by the Spirit. Because if you are led by the Spirit of God and your heart is for the things of God, huh, you can't help but love people. And you're going to want to kick things out of your house. There's so many things I want to kick out of my house. They're not useful to me. The only thing that is useful to me is the Spirit of God. Amen. That keeps my heart soft enough to love people. Because if I don't love people, 
then I need to put this microphone down on the ground and go home. I don't deserve to be standing up here if I don't love people. All of them. Everywhere. Man, I couldn't help uh, falling in love with Santiago and, and Shavai. You can't help but love that man. I mean, love just exudes out of him. I mean, he's just, he's the, wow, it was so amazing. You go to, you go to India, and you can't help but love Raja, Israel. And, and you just can't help yourself unless there's something wrong with your heart. I mean, just love. Do you have love in your heart for people? If you don't, you need to cry out to God and ask Him to give you a new heart because it's not right. Turn to Psalms again. Psalm. Oh, we are in Psalm. How about that? Yay. 85. Go to chapter 85. Psalm 85, verse 1. O oh Lord, you did show favor to your land. You did restore the captivity of Jacob. You did forgive the iniquity of your people. You did cover all their sin. You did withdraw all your fury. You did turn away from them your burning anger. Restore us, O oh God, of our salvation. And cause your indignation toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all the generations? Will you not yourself revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you. See, when you get to the place in your life. And you realize that you have a dry condition. Or a desolate condition. The only place that you can turn, and I know you know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The only place that you can turn to find the remedy for that is to God. Because, see, He is the one and the only one that can restore your heart to a condition of loving other people. To a condition of pureness and holiness. See, He's the only one that can do that. So don't turn to anybody else. And let's go back to the prophets. I like going to those guys. Let's go back to Ezekiel. Y'all y'all still with me? I can't I can't see. I can't see out there. I hope nobody's uh, left or fell asleep yet. But I'm not finished. And I, I want to get finished. But I want to make sure we take time to let the Lord do what He wants to do though. Ezekiel 36. Where am I at? <laughs> I like that. Ezekiel 36. <laughs> yeah, I was a man that needed a new life. I was. I was a man that needed a new life. Verse 8. 36, 8. But you, O mountains of Israel. Pastor Zeke did a good job of teaching about those mountains. That was, that was good. You will put forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel. For they will soon come. For behold, I am for you. And I will turn to you. And you shall be cultivated and sown. And I will multiply men on you. And the house of Israel, all of it. And the cities will be inhabited. And the waste places will be rebuilt. No more desolation. See that? It says it will be rebuilt. Um, skip down a little bit through there. Let's go to verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. 
which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from the lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. Have you ever wondered what happened if you couldn't get clean? Ooh, that's not a good thought, is it? Verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Listen, this is God's promise to not only restore Israel physically, but spiritually. You see, we serve a God that's not just interested in your spiritual restoration. He's interested in you being physically restored. See, there's some people here today that are, that are suffering in their physical bodies. I'm telling you today, God's still in the business of restoring health to people. Amen. I know this to be true. You know why? We came back from Peru in April of this year on a Saturday. And on Tuesday... My youngest daughter calls me from San Antonio where she's going to college. I'm sorry, she called my wife. I was at work. My youngest daughter call, calls from San Antonio, from college. She says, Mom, and you know moms, when they hear their children speak, automatically they know if there's something wrong or something's okay. They just have a way of knowing these things, right? So immediately she knew that something was wrong. And... My daughter, Rebecca, is like, um, yesterday we were in class taking finals. And one of our classmates, also one of their roommates, didn't show up. Straight A student, 21 years old, from somewhere in Central America. Loved to study. Just one of those bookworms, you want to call them, you know, straight A students. She didn't come to the finals. So they were texting during, during the class. You know, where are you at? You got to get here. You have to take this test. All Monday, nothing. Tuesday morning, somehow or another, they found out that Marcia, 21 years old, had been rushed to the emergency room. Her liver completely failed. Completely. They told her that if she didn't get a new liver within two weeks, she would die. 21 years old. When I heard that, I got mad. I got mad at the devil again. I said, we're going to pray for Marcia. Never met this girl. Don't know who she is. I just don't like the enemy beating people up and stealing their health from them. I called people in our church and said, look, we got a desperate situation that we need to pray about. This young lady, 21 years old, she's going to die if she doesn't get another liver. Thursday, we get a phone call. It's Rebecca again. Mom, oh, what's going on now? You know, you, okay, what's going on? You, you're probably not going to believe this, but Marcia got a new liver today. I'm like, two days? Wow, Lord, that was, that was really, that was really quick. Because I don't understand the, uh, the waiting list that you got to be on, the transplant list, how all that works. But to get a liver in two days, I'd have to say that that was God, don't you? I mean, I was prepared to drop everything and go to San Antonio and pray for this lady that I, or young girl that I didn't, never met. I was, I was willing to do that. But we prayed and prayed and prayed and we felt a release from the prayer. But we didn't feel a release to go to San Antonio. So to get this phone call, we're like... Wow, I was really expecting to be in San Antonio that weekend praying for this young lady. So that's a pretty cool story, isn't it? Guess what? That's not the end of the story. Marcia doesn't have any family in San Antonio, so uh, when she gets out of the hospital, she, she was in a coma, just all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. While she was in the coma, they were giving her drugs that she was allergic to that nobody knew she was allergic to. It burnt her insides. 
See, we didn't know this until afterwards because Rebecca went to stay with her to help her out because she didn't have anybody to help her. So Marcia's telling my daughter this story. And she said, when I was out of it, that's all she knew how to describe it. When I was out of it, I began to see this bright light. And while I was looking at this bright light, I heard this voice say, it's time for you to come with me. And now I don't know the details of all of that, but I'd like to think that maybe that's the time when we were storming heaven because we wanted to see a young lady's liver restored back to completeness. And see, I'm telling you that to tell you this. Were you at uh, Teresa Vincent? God's still in the restoration business when it comes to your health. He hasn't quit. And he's not going to quit. He's still in the restoring business. He wants to restore your health back to you. That's another aspect of God's restoration work. And only He can do it. His name is Jehovah Rapha. The God that heals. He can restore you back to your original condition. Verse 27. I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Let me just tell you something. Without the Holy Spirit in your life. Without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible to live a true life. And follow God's ways. Because you're not living a true life. If you're not born of the Spirit. Because the Bible says clearly. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and the daughters of God. You must be baptized in the Holy Ghost if you think you're going to follow these words and put them into practice in your life. You can't do it on your own. You must be born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I don't see any other way around. It's a must. Amen. Hey, let's turn to Joel. We haven't looked in Joel yet. Y'all not falling asleep on me, are you? All right, we're going to go to Joel chapter 2. And while you're going to Joel chapter 2, I'm going to tell you that uh, in chapter 1 of Joel, that the first two chapters here speak of desolation from locusts and armies that God sent on Israel. That was the punishment for rebellion. So let's see what he did about it. Turn to chapter 2. And let's look in verse number 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and he will have pity on his people. And the Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I'm going to send you grain new wine, and new oil, and you will be satisfied and full with them. And I will never again make you a reproach among the nations. Um, skip down to 25, if you would. I'm trying to speed this up a little bit. 25. Then I, will make you, then I will make up to you for the years. In other words, that's restore. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. That the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, and my great army, which I sent amongst you. See, God wants to restore the years that the enemy has stolen from you. That the enemy has eaten up in your life. I'm here to tell you that God wants to restore that. He wants to restore you back to a right relationship with Him. And cause you to do His will and His work. He's telling them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take care of all that stuff that those locusts ate up. They're going to get it back. Verse 26 says, you shall have plenty to eat and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, that my people will never be put to shame. Therefore, you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the, God, the Lord your God, and there is no other, and my people will never be put to shame. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. That's good stuff. Man, that's good. But we're not finished. 
Turn with me to Acts, because we've got to see something. Turn with me to Acts, chapter 3. Somebody in one of their messages spoke about this. I remember it. I don't know who it was, but it was, it was good. Acts, chapter 3, verse 17. Three seventeen, And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. This is Peter preaching to the Sanhedrin and the ruling pastors of the day. He's cutting them down a little bit. He's saying, I know that you acted in, in ignorance. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer... He has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and re return that your sins may be wiped out, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from the ancient times. The Lord gave me the scripture because I needed to learn something here. See, we're all waiting for our king to come back. And he will. But he can't come back yet. Because it says here that he's got to, he's got to wait for the period of restoration that's going to take place. Now, this speaks to me of a, a future restoration. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, we, uh, some of us know that maybe some of that has already begun. I think of one specific thing that has happened that maybe um, speaks to the beginning of this particular restoration, end time restoration to take place. 60 years ago, May, May 14th, 1948. That would be 60 years, right? Did I do my math right? 60? Yeah. 60 years ago. 60 years ago in 1948, the nation of Israel was recognized by the whole world as a nation. Could be that that's the beginning of the restoration that's about to begin and that we get to be a part of. The rest of the world didn't like it. But I just got to tell them, too bad. Too bad. It's written in the book. It's going to happen. And if you want to know what else is going to happen, read the book. It's in there. I promise you. There are future things that are going to be restored. I think it's exciting times. I think it's an exciting time to be a part of the family of God. Matter of fact, I believe that this should be our finest hour. Because God is going to restore all things. Amen. I believe firmly in my heart that God is not done with this country. I believe that he's going to restore this country back to a strong sense of morality. That we will have men of God that won't be ashamed to stand before the White House or the courthouse or wherever and speak the words of the Lord. I believe that there's going to be a move of God across this country to restore that. Uh, I believe that. Call me crazy if you want to. Maybe this is the beginning of that. Because we're, we're raising up disciples that will be involved in bringing this restoration of, of a spiritual restoration to this country. Lord knows we need it. We need it desperately. Turn to Galatians chapter 6. Another one of these that somebody mentioned. That I want to touch on. Galatians chapter 6. Verse number 1. I know y'all are going to be happy to know that you're going to get to stand here in a few minutes. Y'all have been sitting down for a long time. So just bear with me a few more scriptures. Galatians 6, 1. Brothers. Even if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself, lest you too be tempted. 
The, the word restore here in the Greek, it's pretty neat. It's used to describe mending fishing nets. That's how it's used in the Greek, mending fishing nets. Because if a net gets holes in it, it ain't any good. So when it comes in reference to people, then it means that we're going to be involved in dealing with people that need some help developing their character. Not just developing it, but perfecting it. See, that would be the holes that's in their life. God's calling us to do that. To reach out to those that are not living properly. Might be trying to hide something. It's our job to lovingly point that out and say, Hey, look, we're we're here to restore you back to a a right relationship with God. Because if you do not have a right relationship with God, it's going to be difficult for you to have relationships any other way. They won't work this way if if it's not right this way. It won't. All right, let's turn, let's turn to my last one. First Peter. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five, verse six. It says this, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. My Bible actually says your anxiety. (laughs) And Jesus says, don't worry about nothing. So if you worry about something, are you committing sin? Because he said, don't do it. Hmm? Don't do it. Be, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself Restore, strengthen, and establish you. See, not only does he want to restore you, he wants to strengthen you, and he wants to establish you. He wants to establish you as one of his servants, firmly planted in his word, and carrying out his plans for your life. He wants to establish that in you. You know, I find it interesting I find it interesting that people talk about restoration as if it's something that only a few people need or a certain nation needs. Let me just tell you, if that's the way we perceive restoration, we miss out on the full picture. We miss out on the full picture. The full picture is that restoration is God's heart and God's plan for all of us. We are all targets of God's restoration. We are all in the middle of His restoring work in our lives. God's original plan for you was not all wrapped up in salvation. You got saved? That's not the end of the story. That's just the beginning. God's intention and everything that He has designed is not wrapped up in salvation. I'm sorry that I got to tell you that. But it's the truth. His original original, his first plan for you and for me was that we would be filled with his glory. Amen. That's his original intention for you. How many of you Bible scholars, somebody, somebody in here, see if you can rattle off Romans 3.23 off the top of your head. See that? He said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all short of something here today. We are short of his glory because that's what he wants for you. 
That rebellion and that sinful, prideful heart that you have, it keeps God from filling you with His glory. Therefore, you're not fulfilling His full intention for you because His full intention is for you to be full of His glory. Amen. That's God's intention for you and for everything else. That's why the Bible teaches us that the earth will one day be restored. Amen. It will be. It will one day be restored. Let me just tell you something before we close. God is obsessed with redemption. <laughs> he's obsessed with it. And I want to stand here and give glory to God and thank Him that He's never uh, happy or content to leave anything or anyone in a fallen state. Amen. Or a state of desolute, destitution. Or a state of hardness. God's never happy with that. That's not His intent. He's constantly, His heart is for us to be totally restored and be full of His glory. So, the only way that we're going to get from desolation to restoration is the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. We're not going to get there on our own. We must be baptized in the Holy Ghost. See, that's the change that brings uh, your heart to a place where it's open towards God. And it also is the place where it allows you to have a hatred for sin and the things that don't please God. Amen. So we're going to, hopefully, we're going to worship again. And I'm going to ask you, I know everybody's probably already said this, but you need, to, you need to investigate the hidden caverns of your heart. You know, if there's unforgiveness in there, that's rebellion. If there's lust in there, that's rebellion against God. If there's something hidden way down in there, I think it was Pastor Massey that said, oh, don't touch that one. No, we're going to touch it. Because we're going to stomp it out and get rid of it or else you cannot f fulfill God's total uh, plan and intention for your life and that's to be filled with His glory. So we're going to need the Holy Spirit right now. So I'm going to turn this back over to Pastor Eric and uh, Pastor Matt and you guys uh, take us to the next step. Hey, don't y'all love His heart? The Gospel of John has always been one of my favorite. What a beautiful book. And by the time you reach the end of John's life, he's writing the epistles of John, and they're, they're fairly straightforward. Says things like, he who sins is of the devil. You know, when I talk to Eric sometimes, I feel that way. It's straightforward. You know what causes desolation? Rebellion. If your life is desolate, now you know how you got there. You know what causes the cure? Repentance. Yep. Now we know how to get out. I love that about Eric. He can take a subject that feels complex. Every time I meet a man who doesn't want to repent, what he says is his situation is complex. No, it's actually not that complex. It's as simple as Eric just made it. Pastor Treister, we appreciate you. New Life, we appreciate you.